David Bohm Seminars number one, Sunday evening, November 5th, 1989, session two, Oak Grove School, Ojai, California. Yes, well, I think we've been discussing some of the things that go wrong uh, with the thought process and how we can begin to do something. Uh, now, I would like to discuss something more general or more uh, more deeper. And uh, the uh, see, to begin, we were discuss we've been discussing the ego, the self, you know, the self-interest. You see that this it all seems to focus. All these troubles seem to focus on that point, right? And uh, the uh, why should they? You know, the the uh, we find that the thought about the self helps to define the self, right? Gives you a sense of self, right? Just as we've been talking about with the t with the telephone bell and the <laughs> and the image of the television set, and the uh, uh, we make assumptions, you see, which uh, we identify with ourselves. Like we say, we are such and such people. Our country is such and such. We have such and such duties and such and such guilt and such and such this and that, right? And we defend those assumptions against evidence that they're false. Right? Because they're identified with ourselves, it's as if we're defending ourselves. <laughs> so thought goes wrong, right? Now, how does this all come about? You see, uh, uh, what is the self? You see, is there a self? I mean, I'm not saying yes or no. You see, we have to raise the question, right? <laughs> there are three words which mean refer to the self, three main words. One is me. <laughs> that is the self as object, right? Me is the self to which everything happens, right? 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 And there's the word I, which is the subject, the self, which is the doer, the seer, you know, the thinker, the source of intention, action, and so on. Hmm? And there's the third word, this, uh, myself, which somehow is between the two, right? <laughs> myself is supposed to be something which can be both I and me, <laughs> right? So you could say the concept of myself is that I and me are the same, right? <laughs> that I, I as subject and the same as me as object, huh? Right. Now, it is difficult to maintain this, you see, uh, because we've discussed this before. There's a tendency to believe, to, in the very concept of I, to take that as the unlimited, <laughs> as God, right? We've discussed this, I think most of you have heard this, about, say, Moses with, talking to the voice in the burning bush in the desert and he asked the voice, what is its name? And well, he asked, who shall I say sent me? You know, the voice said, you shall say, quote, I am sent you, indicating the voice meant that I am was its name, right? Hmm? I mean. hmm? I am, I mean. No, it wasn't any. It was a yeah, which means I will be. There's no way to say I am in Hebrew. There's no present tense of the verb am. But it said I will be, which meant uh, I will be forever, you see. And the uh, the voice said, that's my name, you see. <laughs> now, uh <laughs> The the point is, it seems strange, but actually it was a very brilliant perception on the part of Moses that I am is properly means whatever God means. <laughs> hmm. mm -hmm. It means something of unlimited power, unlimited creativity, unlimited this or that, right? And the uh, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, the very notion of I am is something that ought to be unlimited. The very notion of me is something that's got to be limited, <laughs> right? <laughs> It's limited and there's no way out of it. It's necessary. And yet we equate the two. We say, I, I am is the same as me. Now that is not very coherent, you see. So we say, myself is this uneasy union of I am and me. <laughs> right? uh, now, the, uh, 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 now, there seems to be already a trouble in there, a contradiction of some kind of incoherence. And... See, and you can see megalomania is one sign of that, that people want to magnify themselves and say, I am the greatest, the best, my power is infinite, <laughs> I, can, I rule all the kings, I defeat everybody, you know, I'm the greatest, uh, I have done, you know, I've done this, I've done that, and so on, you see, and, and somehow it creates inside a felt, a wonderful felt in me, right? <laughs> and <clears throat> the idea is to try to turn me into I am, right? <laughs> You see, we all see that me is not the same as I am. Everybody says, look, that's little me, you see. Look, at you're very limited. You're nothing, you see. You think you're great, the great I am, but you're really not very much. <laughs> that's what everybody is saying right? <laughs> to the little child. <laughs> and that goes on to the program, right? It makes it a problem. Now, the, uh, so therefore, 
you have this difficulty between I am the unlimited and me the limited. And that's called the self. Now, there are other things. See, the, we see with regard to the human being that there is an action which flows out from the human being, right? A perception and so on, which suggests I am. And there's things you can do to the human being which suggests he's just an object, right? But human beings don't want to be treated as objects. One of my reasons for getting angry is he treated me as a thing, you see. <laughs> and yet, you see, so there's a tremendous contradiction because uh, do you believe you're not a thing? You see, see, <laughs> uh, you're beyond being a thing, right? You see, I'm no thing, but I don't mean by that mere vacuity. I mean I'm beyond being a mere thing, right? <laughs> Which is limited. Hmm? So the, uh, uh, now, uh, uh, that, that, that sort of thing is behind the thought about the self. You see, and the thought about the self that may seem very abstract, but it has tremendous power in the emotions and in the body, right? It's the very central thought, right? Now, the, uh, uh, it, it stirs up things at the very center and the very core are the most powerful things, you see. So that, <clears throat> now the question is, we don't know whether there's a self or not, right? But we can see something about what happens with the concept of the self as we know it, you see. We say there's I am, we can say, when you think, we suggested that the first immediate thought has no, con no, no, no sense of the self who's thinking it. Your only, only consciousness is of what you're thinking about, right? And then later you can say, for some reason you say, who was it? where did that thought come from? And so on, it came from me, right? <laughs> you see, then you may get a sense that it is I who am doing the thinking, right? The same as the, it is, the, it is from the television set that the bell is coming, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. You see, that the sense of I and me is, is produced by thought, and, but that thought is very powerful. It actually produces I and me. It, it just doesn't sit there producing an, an image of I and me, but that image is in consciousness, and the whole being has supreme value. The whole being organizes itself according to that thought. So the thought of I, myself, me, myself, and I, as they say, the three of us, <laughs> uh, produces th that being, right? Mm -hmm. So th the self is a being, but a being... I'm suggesting, which depends on thought to be produced. Now, there may be some true being beyond that, you see, which is also me in some sense, but the self that we experience is mostly the self which is produced out of thought. That doesn't mean it's unreal, you see. And the mistake is to say it has nothing to do with thought. It's there whether you think, the same as the table, whether you think about it or not. Hmm. Hmm. So if you make that mistake, you can't deal with it, you see. Now, there may be a true being that we don't know, which is not thought. In fact, I remember long ago reading about an ancient way of looking at things which said that I, I am the unknown. I am unknown, what I am, but it's constantly being revealed what I am. <laughs> and you see, that was another way of looking at it, right? Hmm? Now, that would be a, another way of looking at the self as unlimited, right? but a different kind of self right? than the self we think of now, right? and that we experience now. Now, if you could take that notion seriously, you would experience the self rather differently. Hmm? You would feel, I am the unknown. There's some, perhaps some infinite, unlimited source from which I am coming, and it's all coming out, right? <laughs> and therefore, I could say the unlimited acts through me, right? Hmm? Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the thing is then to say then, in that case, it might create a great sense of security because you could say, well, <laughs> if it's the unlimited, it will know what to do, right? <laughs> uh, but it could, it could be you're fooling yourself. You see, this, this could turn also into illusion, right? <laughs> now, uh, the, uh, because people who feel that God is acting through them often become very uh, difficult. <laughs> now, uh, the, uh, so, uh, but anyway, this just illustrates the different ways and, and see, some people think there was no clear notion of the self in very early period of human development, that they didn't clearly, just, like I said, the spirit was both the breath and the, what we call spirit, both inside and outside. But the, the three things that we would perceive as breathing and wind, four things, breathing, wind. Breathing would be the spirit, the actual breath, and also the spirit at the same time. And the wind would be the actual wind, and it would be a general spirit which moves everything, like the trees and so on. Hmm. So uh, they would experience that as all one, just as you experience the sound from the television set and the 
image of the telephone as one, right? <laughs> or it, what you experience that what you see and what you hear are basically the same thing, right? <laughs> Though the experience is very different. <laughs> so you see, uh, the uh, point is that the, uh, the form of the experience may be very different, but its meaning may be that it's all one, <laughs> right? You see, and, and you, re you respond to the meaning, not to the form, right? And not to the outward form only, huh? So the, uh, that, that determines your being, you see, according to what it means. Now, therefore, this is very important, you see. If the self means a certain thing to us, it's going to rule our lives, uh, that meaning. Hmm. See, if the self means something limited, little me, then you will say, I'm very limited, I can't do anything, you know, I have no power. And then you say, but I ought to have power, I'm also I am. <laughs> I'm not satisfied to be just little me. <laughs> I feel unhappy about that. <clears throat> and you have the conflict, right? And, you tr and then people feel powerless and say, see, as children, they were told they were nothing, that they had no power, they couldn't do this, they couldn't do that. And then that's on the program. <laughs> they have accepted the truth of that. They have said, my parents and other people who know, that, who know what's what have told me that's the case, and that must be true, and this must be real, what I'm experiencing, and that's it. <laughs> I have real powerlessness, and then I... I create, out of that I create powerlessness because I constantly don't use the power that I may have, right? Hmm? Mm -hmm. You see, so uh, the, uh, uh, now, on the other hand, somebody else may counteract that by saying, I'm the greatest, I'm wonderful. But, and then he may get a lot of power out of that, but then it c creates a lot of trouble, right? <laughs> for him and for other people. You see, so it, it isn't really a solution to go to the other side and say, I'm the greatest, I'm wonderful, I, I have, I have great power, I can do anything, right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, now, uh, the, uh, okay, so the, the, the point now is that once you have this thought, you see, you have a thought, and if you, if you begin to say that thought refers to something outside, say, such as the table, there is implied the fact that there is a thinker who is having that thought, right, <laughs> inside. <laughs> Before you make that division, you don't have to imply the thinker, the subject, or the object. Right? You see that there may have been a time when people didn't give a lot of emphasis to subject and object, but it built up gradually as we tried to use thoughts to refer to things that we felt were outside, and as we used thoughts literally and tried to control things and so on. We had to then thought and then imply the controller inside, and you experienced it, right? So and that, that experience seems to prove it's real, right? Now, that, that thing which is called I, me, and myself is obviously very central and very important. And therefore, it's, it's implicitly, it's equated with your life, the essence of your life, and therefore it will be defended, right? Now, but its content is thought, basically. It's defined by what you think about it. See, if you think I'm, I, I'm good because of this, this, and this, you get, there's a good feeling all around. And then if somebody challenge, questions that, you get a bad feeling all around. Hmm. You see, and then you defend it, right? Now you then you see. Now, in order to defend that self, you have to defend the thoughts which make it up, right? But to defend thoughts is absurd, right? <laughs> Against evidence that they may be false. Huh? You see, that that's where the problem is. You see, if you have an opinion which is just an assumption in thought, people often defend them, right? There's an emotional charge, and they try to defend them. In this whole group, there may be many opinions, and people could be defending them with emotional charges. You see, now, uh, other people say, well, everybody has a right to his opinion, we don't care, you see. But still, uh, we don't get together. Hmm? So, I'm suggesting that this is a crucial question because if we could uh, understand that an opinion is not to be defended, it's just, we, we must hold it in suspension neutrally as we hold all these other things in suspension. And then we will all hold all the opinions and see what value they have or don't have and we will then be in a different state of mind, right? <laughs> you see, but we have opinions which really refer to ourselves. Uh, they may seem to refer to something else, but, in print, but ultimately you'll find that it refers to yourself. <laughs> That's why you defend it. <laughs> but it's hidden that it refers to yourself very often. You see, so uh, you have this question, and we'll discuss this in the dialogue, how, we, how this defense of opinions prevents people from <clears throat> communicating, right? But the basic spirit of the dialogue we can discuss now, and also even when you're by yourself, which is you could hold all the opinions together and don't let them run away and believe they're true and don't believe they're false and don't suppress them and don't carry them out, but just consider them, right? What do they mean? Hmm?
Now that would be the spirit of the dialogue, which you can have entirely by yourself or with another person or two or three or ten or twenty or whatever. Eh? <clears throat> now we'll just try to, and, the, and tomorrow we'll go into that in more you know, detail. But uh, the uh, uh, now uh, and the spirit of the dialogue then touches implicitly on the question of the meaning of the self, right? <laughs> that you're not identified with your opinions, you see, and your assumptions, <clears throat> uh, nor your self-interest, right? Well, it may be, but you're... You're looking at it, right? Yeah. Yeah, if you are, you acknowledge it and look at it, right? Oh, there's a suspension also. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so it's all... Dialogue is an extension to a collective context of the whole thing we're talking about uh, mm-hmm. until now, right? Remarkable that in colloquial Thai language, what? In, my, in the colloquial Thai language, which is spoken by 90% of the people, the me and myself doesn't exist. No. The fur, let's say David said, said that, for saying that. Yes, but still they probably think the same way as we do. Yeah, perhaps so, it's not maybe so deeply. We're not, I mean, not quite. You see, like, not quite. And see that, and see, Hebrew is a language which is entirely based on verb, verbal roots, but people have come to use it exactly the same as they use other Indo-European languages like English. And you can see no difference in the way they're using it, you see, because you can, the meanings change. It depends which they use it. The user side who comes from a tradition of myself and I, so it doesn't change. Yeah, but I mean, but the contact of the ties with the rest of the world. Not much. It's the only country which was never a colony. Yeah, well, uh, maybe. You see, uh, uh, I think that uh, we'd have to go into all that, but uh, I mean, I really wanted to Sorry, not, 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 not to focus on this point, you see. Now, the, uh, 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 but uh, in any case, this notion of me, myself, and I is either explicitly or implicitly the dominant one in the modern world. <clears throat> now, whether we have capitalism or communism or the third, first world or the second world or the third world, <clears throat> that's the dominant theme, right? Now, the, uh, 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 now, uh, and I, I, we've seen that it's no use confronting this head-on because you don't know what you're doing. We've got to really find out what it's all about, right? By actually seeing as a fact what the process is. Huh? Right now, uh, the uh, uh, so we question this notion of the self. We're not saying there is or is not a self. We're not going to condemn the self. You see, if you judge the self to be bad, that's just the same as the judgment that we talked about before. It just simply is the same old story. Okay. That, that, that judgment is automatic. It's not a perception of the badness of the self. We don't know what the self is, so how could we judge it to be bad, you see? So uh, uh, if you judge it to be good, it's just the same, right? Hmm? See, it could only be automatic, you see, so a part of the program. So uh, we have to be careful. We don't, uh, when we hold this in suspension, we're not making judgments. Or if we are, we then say we acknowledge it. We try to put those judgments explicitly in words, right? Say, this is what I am doing. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, uh, so that finally you can get to see what's happening, right? Hmm? That there's a whole process which goes far beyond the visible level, uh, not only inside of us, but between us, right? Hmm? Now, uh, all right, and, and that, that's the concrete process which, you, which uh, really makes us one, though it may make us one whole in conflict, right? <laughs> Even when you're in conflict, it's all one, but it's, <laughs> it's in conflict, right? It's not an orderly, harmonious whole. Right? It's not a coherent whole. Uh, it, it breaks into bits which are in conflict, but it's still the whole. Now, the... Uh, uh, now... Okay, well, that, uh, that, that's a sort of a uh, beginning about the self. And I, I'm suggesting that the ground of this whole being is, is the unlimited. We've gone into that in previous meetings. And I don't want to repeat it now, except to say a few words. That uh, the, uh, uh, we've said that uh, even that ancient view of um, I, am con- I am unknown but constantly revealing myself implies that my source is the unlimited, right? Hmm. Now, and therefore, as uh, moving from the unlimited, if I really could do that, perhaps you could say there would be an action that would be generally right. And, but we would get free, of, we would not be stuck with the limitations of our programs, right? It would use the programs, but not be dominated by them. Uh, 
Uh, now, uh, the, uh, uh, we said, like, for example, that the unlimited must contain the limited. If we say the unlimited and the limited are different, then the unlimited is limited by not being the limited. <laughs> so therefore, the, the, the true being of the, un, of the limited is the unlimited. Right? That was what we suggested. So mm -hmm. the true being of the self, of the limited self, is something unlimited, <laughs> whatever, you know. The limited is a subset of the unlimited? Yes, but it, it's, a, it's not exactly a subset because then that would suggest another set. Well, the limited would be, no, but you see, the unlimited would be an unlimited set. Yes, but still it would be limited by not being this subset. You see, it would, you have to be careful. You have to get the logic right. You see, if we make this incoherent at this level, it's going to all tangle up, right? Now, one view is to say we have the whole, right, the unlimited. And we abstract a subset from it, we call that the limited. The rest is what? The unlimited? Well, it's not that the rest is. The limited is just a part of it. The right limited is a part of the unlimited. Therefore, the unlimited contains the limited. Yeah. Therefore, in, 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 it's not right to say it's a separate subset, you no, see. It's really, it's abstracted. No. Yes, but you have to, it depends on how you think. If you think the objects exist separately, as they often do, you see, but we have to say each member of the set is really the unlimited, fundamentally. It's a, an aspect of the unlimited, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore... Hmm? But you say it partakes in the unlimited. It partakes of the unlimited and it, it takes part in some way, but it, well, it, obviously in some sense you would say it's taking part maybe much less significant, right? But it's important still in some way. Now, the uh, 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 so we have mutual participation of all finite things in the unlimited and in each other. And this is this flow we talked about before between people and between us and the unlimited and back and so on. And our whole being, its source is the unlimited, but we have a flow which also includes a flow between the limited, which is really the flow in the unlimited, right? Now, uh, the... Uh, uh, so... Now that's important because that changes the way, for the moment it's only a map, you see. If we can really see how it works, then it would change our being, hmm? right? In the same way, you see, that uh, we are present, we may say this is a very nice map, it sounds convincing, but there's another map in the unconscious, in the, in the programs, which is still working, right? The other map, pro, map says, oh, that all sounds very nice, but in the real world, <laughs> this is what we've got to do, <laughs> right? Now, that's working in spite of your agreement with this, what I say. <laughs> so it won't, therefore, it's going to be, it won't really quite operate yet. <laughs> well, even if that wasn't working, and yeah. it was just an agreement with the map, it still wouldn't necessarily work at all. No, we've got to see the, how to map and get into the territory, right? We've got to get into the concrete, as we're saying, the concrete meaning, right? Uh, uh, of the actual process hmm? in order to make this work. Hmm? You see, so, but it's necessary to discuss it as an abstract map to begin with. Right? Now, uh, so we've got this unlimited now. We're saying the self, what is it? You see, the self is clearly, in some sense, very limited if it's defined by thought. But thought itself, what is thought? Mm -hmm. Is thought the limited or the unlimited? Yeah, well, everything is the unlimited, so thought's got to be it too, right? <laughs> in its true being, but the content of thought is limited. Specific. The content that we see, we don't see the true being of thought as a concrete process. We see its meaning, right? That meaning is limited. But the true being of thought is also of the unlimited, is, you know, is also the unlimited, but uh, as the true being of anything is. Uh, now, but if thought has a wrong notion of what its true being is, it's going to act according to that notion, right? And it will tangle up. So those people who have insights or creative people or Yes, I think that the moment of insight, nobody is conscious of himself that it is I who am having this insight. <laughs> if he's if he's doing that, he's not having an insight, right? <clears throat> you see, at the next moment, he may say, "What was this insight? What does it mean?" 
And he gets a picture of it. And then he says, it is I who have this picture, right? <clears throat> but you can have a, is it possible to have a picture of an insight which is not necessarily connected to the eye? There may be a picture coming up and you don't connect it to the eye. Yes, you see, but I'm trying to say the usual way is to say, here is this picture and it is I who have it, right? That's Certainly, that, that's clearly the experience, but it's, it's just important to keep all the possibilities. Yeah, now the, the picture may just work as uh, just simply it's there, right? Yes, but now we have a language which says if there is perception, something has got to perceive it, right? <laughs> now, but you see, that in the same way, uh, I suggested this morning that w the word observe might mean gathering, you know, gathering it with the senses or something, right? Or later, gathering it with the intention in the mind, right? It brings it all together. <clears throat> Observation just takes place then. You see, we change the meaning of the word observe from the common meaning, or we extend it in some way, so that it covers this, right? Hmm. Saying observation goes on, and then, and then thought says there was an observer who did it, right? Uh, so uh, the uh, we'll say that observation is something that goes on, just like anything else goes on. And uh, you can say one theory is that the brain is like a, a complex machine that constructs consciousness. There's another theory due to another idea due to a, a po more poetic and artistic idea due to Coleridge, who suggested that it's the imagination that does this. You see, he says he calls he says perception. See, we all are beginning to agree that what we perceive is actually created somehow by, uh, by in our uh, mind, right, in our brain or whatever. Hmm? One view is to the scientific technological view to say it's a it's a super wonderful computer that does this, right. Another view is a more artistic, poetic view, which says it's a creative imagination. <laughs> the imagination is what the same thing which creates the objects and the things we see is what we experience in a secondary way as the as the creative imagination of something new. That's what he's suggesting. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Can you say that once more? The, the same. We know we might have a creative imagination of something new. He said the source of seeing the things that we see in perception is the same as the source of the creative imagination, right? And then besides that, we have a second, we have a, what he calls fancy or fantasy, which is the imagination coming from the program, <laughs> right? The old stuff, the reworking of old images, hmm. okay? It's the artist then that uses this creative imagination, hmm. and he's more aware of it than Yeah, well, it's fundamentally everybody, but the artist does it in a certain way. Now, even to make any, to get a new discovery, the scientist has to do it too, right? You see, so uh, the, uh, uh, the no, but now if we have the idea that imagination is just some, uh, is just fantasy, then we will get muddled up on this, right? You see, now it's always just fantasy, right? Uh, so that, that, that's one point then, uh, that uh, uh, somehow our perceptions are created in response to whatever information we get, right? <laughs> From the senses and, and elsewhere. That seems to be what's emerging, whether we look at it scientifically or otherwise. Uh, but uh, it might be better to look at it from this artistic point of view, saying fundamentally, this is more this is more fundamental than the scientific point. The scientific point of view has it is necessary, but the artistic point of view is finally more fundamental because, after all, finally, what's coming is due to this subtle movement, like the bicycle riding mind or the the thought itself, due to subtle processes which are which are an art right hmm? so that finally it's the art artistic feature which is the thing where it will really work right uh, but our age has turned this upside down right our present culture has turned this upside down hmm? right? and that muddles things up you see because we're looking for a formula there for <laughs> to ride the bicycle <laughs> you see so the uh, 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 now, therefore, we have to. Have, let's suppose we have this attitude in going to, to, to find out what we're talking about. That we have this artistic attitude that we are, have to have a creative movement from the unknown, from the unlimited, which creates the forms that we see and know, or imagine, or, or, or create technologically, or whatever. Hmm. Hmm. I say so. Uh, th this is basically the source, you see, that of perception, right? That, when you perceive the meaning, the deep meaning of it as a whole, right? Uh, now, 
the uh, uh, and this can be developed into reason and logic and all sorts of other ways, you see, to make it more detailed and so on. Hmm. I were reading some in, something with information then, but you, it, is what you're saying how you, how it becomes a part of you? Well, not only that, but how you manage to see what it means. Yes, is the creative... Yeah. But if you're just regurgitating... You're going with the old meanings that... Yeah, well, you know already, you see, but if you're going to anything creative, must be, bring a new meaning, right? But then, isn't that, a, isn't that you, in other words, you're creating it and I'm creating well, it, but are it's you, not the same, is it? Well, what's creating it, we don't know. You see, right, right. if you say, I am creating it, that, that is a picture, that, is, that can only come from a concept, right, of saying that this, first you say creation is going on, and then you ask, what does it mean, who created it, right? So you say, I created it, you will experience it that way. Well, something... Yeah, something created it. Yeah, but you don't know if it's even within, because we say it may come from the unlimited. Right? Then it would be the same? <clears throat> Ultimately the same, but there's a moment, there's a relative difference, but the ultimate source is the one, right? The source is the same, but... But it, it, it's like the tree, which grows into many branches. Right? You see, that, that's the suggestion. I mean, this is not, I'm not saying we're, we are merely discussing the meaning of this. You see, the whole spirit of the thing is we, it's no use talking about truth if we don't see the meaning, right? So in discussing what does all this mean, I'm suggesting everybody here may have to be in that process, right? It seems interesting that if you look at the, some of the history of man, if you look at uh, Neil's Bohr's work, uh, Jesus coming in from the desert, to Moses from the mountain. It seems like a lot of these insights come at a time when you're not thinking or working. It's where they're close to nature, where there's kind of a freedom. And all of a sudden, they have these great insights or perceptions. It comes at a time when they're not expecting it. Yes, well, it doesn't come from the program, you see, and the, the expectations come from the program. Now, it's influenced somehow, a lot, in a lot of cases, by nature, being close to nature. Well, that, that's one way, yes. Uh, but uh, whatever it is... Uh, uh, the, 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 the ordinary level of thought has to die down, right? Mm -hmm. It has to, uh, to leave room for this. And the case would have to be a different facet of the old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the, uh, when the ordinary level of thought dies down, you see, as we look into this, I think you may notice at this moment that perhaps the thought has been slowing down. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Yeah, you see, uh, uh, we don't ordinarily notice it, and therefore we don't learn, right? You see, so the the point is that thought, when you c contemplate these things or look at them, thought begins to slow down and this creative thing happens. You see, whether you call it imagination or something else, you know, uh, that uh, you may not like the word, some people don't like it, but it, it has some advantages over saying it's a machine anyway. <laughs> right? uh, so uh, uh, the... Uh, <clears throat> uh, now... Uh, so uh, I'm saying that it is this imagination which can see the very subtle workings of this whole thing, right? Just as it sees the table. Fu fundamentally, the, our ability to perceive objects comes from this. As it gets more subtle and goes into the infinite, <laughs> then it can see the subtle features of, of the whole process, right? You see that there is something, I'm suggesting this, this is something, you just see the meaning. Don't accept it as true, you see. If you once accept, that will be a judgment of truth, which will be the same as if you say, well, your father and mother know what's true, and that, that's what must be true, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, now, so, now, if you, if we can stay with this and say, just see the meaning, and perhaps truth emerges, you know, unannounced in this whole meaning, right? <laughs> Uh, we could discuss what is truth, if you like. Uh, perhaps we'll do that for a minute and then try to bring in the question of time, right? Hmm. Now, you see, we've discussed the question of meaning and its coherence, right? Hmm. Or incoherence. Now, uh, the word true, it's hard. There's the most elementary theory of truth is the correspondence theory, which says that a true thought corresponds to reality, like a picture to an object, right? 
various parts of the picture correspond to various parts of the object. Well, that's a very a rather limited view of truth. It has it's a part of it, but it's limited. You see, if you take a map, for example, it corresponds to the country, but it's a very abstract correspondence. The line on the map is an abstraction. The line between countries is an abstraction. So it's a correspondence of abstractions. Or if you say you draw a road on the map, the road the line is an abstraction, but so is the road. The road merges with the country. <laughs> it's an abstraction to think of the road, right? <laughs> As separate. Hmm? So uh, therefore. A truth does include a correspondence of certain abstractions that help guide you, you see. But there's something more to it. It implies some sort of coherence of the whole action that follows, right? Not only outside, but inside. Hmm. Hmm. And see, it's interesting that there are three, in three languages I know, I can discuss, see, find the derivation of words. You see, the word true in English means straight, true line, honest, faithful. And obviously that's part of truth, right? To be honest and true and straight. <laughs> if you're not that way, there'll be no truth, right? <laughs> now, in Latin, the word verus means that which is, basically, its root. So that's a part of truth, too. It's got to be that which is in some sense. And in Greek, there's, I think there's a word aletheia, is that right? Yes, aletheia. Aletheia, which means uh, not a, a, awake or not asleep, right? Yes, out of lethargy. What? Out of lethargy. <laughs> yes, out of lethargy, good. And that's necessary for truth also, right? <laughs> if you're lethargic, you're not going <laughs> to... So, uh, the, uh, uh, I don't know. There are probably other languages where you could try to find the derivation of the word. But I don't know them. <laughs> uh, now, uh, because, you know, Latin would include, and English together would include most of the Indo-European. I don't know what it is in Sanskrit. Uh, but uh, the... Uh, uh, now... Uh, so you could say that here are three aspects of truth that are very important. You see, truth is a, is a movement which has got to be uh, not lethargic. It's got to be straight, honest, and faithful, and it's got somehow not only to correspond to that which is, but to be that which is, right? You see, the truth is that which is. The truth, This true movement is that which is, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a part of it anyway, you know, a key part of it. Uh, so that if we say there is truth here, then that is to say this concrete re movement of, of meaning is, is part of truth, right? Hmm? You see, so uh, the, uh, now our whole language doesn't go that way. You see, the way we use language ordinarily tends to think, lead us to experience it otherwise, right? Hmm? Uh, now, so truth would emerge, you see, if we begin to, first we look at our, programs and see how they're leading us astray and get free of them so we're straight <laughs> otherwise we're self-deceptive and twisted and crooked right? and secondly we've got to wake up <laughs> not to be lethargic and you know perhaps you are waking up <laughs> at this moment right and thirdly it's, it's it's got to be in correspondence with that which is but also to be that which is right so the truth is uh, see when the truth is being, right? Not just about being. Not my truth against your truth. Well, you see, when we have that, um, the, the, our opinions, and we hold our opinions, then we think our opinions are true, and we can't agree. Now, Lost. Yeah, so if we can work through those opinions and look at the meaning of all of them, then we have a, a movement in which truth can arise. Huh? You see. Uh, now, therefore, you can't start and say, this is what's true, and so on. If you want to start that way, then you'll never get there, right? You see that? And in fact, you see, this is one of the difficulties. Religious people begin by saying the truth is this notion of God is true. The other one says that one is true, and they can never meet. No two religions have ever managed to meet. <laughs> you see, it's, it works out that way in science, too, very often. We say, my theory is true, your theory is true, and we get into the same problem. <laughs> uh, so we have got to have a dialogue, you see. <laughs> Right, that's what I've been talking about, right? Hmm. Uh, this dialogue is more than just an exchange. It has some more fundamental meaning. You know, it, it has to do with, uh, with the uh, possibility of society cohering and also with the sacred or whatever you want to call it, the unlimited, the, the holy, the total, you know, the, the infinite, whatever. Hmm. Uh, if we don't go into that, then we can't get, uh, can't get into it, right? Now, uh, so, uh, 
we have this question of truth then. There's meaning and truth, you see. Now, meaning, the coherence of meaning is close to the question of beauty, right? The sense, the way we sense all that is a sense of beauty, right? Hmm. You see, so they're really related. When people have said that beauty and truth are related or some, like, poets like Keats have uh, equated them, <laughs> but at least they're very closely related if you don't quite equate them, right? <laughs> Of the whole, which is truth, is a sense of beauty. There will be the sense of the, the way it's experienced in the sense is beauty, right? It may be experienced intellectually as coherence of the thought, and it could be experienced in other ways as coherence of action and coherence of feeling. <clears throat> but you can't come to the table with an idea of what beauty is. It has to, the other yeah. way around. It comes. Yeah. Up. yeah. Yeah, see, and so there's the beauty of nature which induces in us uh, the right kind of mind, you see, the coherent mind. Huh? Uh, but then the trouble is, as soon, uh, not only, as soon as we leave, we're back, or else even before we leave, we begin to get used to it and go back to our old programs, right? Hmm? Would a laser be a good analogy? Well, a laser is coherent. It's a nice analogy to coherence, that we have light moving this way and that way and so on, ordinary light. In the laser, it's all coherent, working together, right, in phase. And the laser can build up to a tremendous intensity and, and do things which ordinary light can't do, right? So that could be a sort of an image of coherence. It's not, it's, it's a metaphor, right? Hmm? Uh, so uh, uh, if we could all cohere in our mind and our thoughts, we would have an instrument that was like a laser rather than like ordinary light. <laughs> Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, now, uh, so you can see that there is open, in this thing, there is potentially there is some really fundamental change in our whole being. You see, the change, this, this is a change of meaning at the very root, which if we could realize it, make it real, <laughs> make it, <laughs> would be a change of being, right? Hmm. And we may be already realizing it to some extent, right? We mustn't say we're not realizing it. Hmm. Uh, but when we go out, we'll get involved in all the affairs of the world and so on, and the, all that stuff will come back probably. Now, that doesn't mean that it's all uh, the case is lost, you see. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now, uh, the, uh, but we've got to keep working at all these things, right? Hmm. You say there will be a change in being, but there's still a being. We say we're not denying being, you see, but the question is, what is the nature of being? Is it separate beings? Is it one being? Is it coherent being, incoherent being? Hmm? But I'm suggesting we, that being can change to a different kind of being, right? Uh, so our present being is in some way very unsatisfactory and inadequate. Right? I'm suggesting that the being could change to something quite a bit better. <laughs> Uh, hmm? What well, you said about truth um, pointed something very clear. The oh. one, the, what you said about truth, what truth is, seemed very clear. There was one thing that came to me is that uh, it seems that truth is the only thing that cannot be changed by thought. If it's truth, if it's the truly the truth. <laughs> Yes, well, true. if it's truly the truth, then thought can't affect it, you see, now. It's just independent of thought. It's beyond thought, you see. It's in the, it, I suggest its source is the unlimited. In other words, don't, it does not begin with any, its source is not in the individual or in the collective. Yeah, no, it's not owned by, neither by an individual nor by a society, nor... Uh, yes, uh, and you see the question of beauty and the artistic approach. You see, our age is tending to overemphasize the technical approach. There was a previous age which was not emphasizing it enough. <laughs> uh, now, the uh, 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 this present approach. It takes art, not, it doesn't take art very seriously. It's a sort of entertainment or pleasure or something. I remember reading an article who said the function of the artist is to gratify people 
And the fu function of a scientist is, is to grub for truth, you see. <laughs> uh, uh, to, which will be useful for people. Uh, so uh, that, that reduces everything to something rather trivial, you see. Then the, uh, uh, now, uh, uh, so uh, we have to see that to change, the, see that there's a certain change in our fundamental thoughts we have got to consider, because you may say it's only thought. Why bother? Why not just get to the truth? <laughs> the answer is that you are already, all of us are already conditioned and programmed by the other kind of thought, right? <laughs> you may say, let's just get to the truth. It doesn't change the program. You see, it still works the same as ever. <laughs> uh, so it won't happen. You see. So we have to look, saying we become aware that we are conditioned, we become aware that other notions of truth are possible, and so on, you see. Hmm? In other words, we have to, our thought has to participate too. You can't say everything will participate except thought. You see, we, we, we exclude thought. <laughs> That's not the unlimited, right? Because it's limited by not including thought. <laughs> uh, now, uh, therefore, Thought has to take part too, right? It, it may not be the most important thing or anything like that, but it has its part, right? And its part may be important. You see, if you have an airplane, it may come down for rather trivial reasons. <laughs> In England, one came down because there were two, there were engines and there were wire, there were wires which told you, carry the signal as to what was happening in the engine, right? Well, they got crossed <laughs> when the plane was made. So the, the pilot thought, you know, that one of the engines failed, right? Or was failing. The pilot said, turn it off. But what happened, he was turning off the good engine. The, the plane came down and killed a lot of people. <laughs> it's a trivial error, right? The plane was a wonderful plane. It was very well built. <coughs> but still, just getting two wires crossed brought it down. <laughs> so maybe thought is not all that important, but if you cross a couple of wires there, it'll bring you the whole thing down. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same as Freud said. It may not be, it's, uh, 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 it may be fatal, but it, uh, though it may not be as serious, it's not, it could be fatal. Right? <laughs> uh, you see, so therefore, it's part of the whole thing. You see, uh, thought can also do all sorts of things. It has produced very great discoveries in science and uh, in the arts as well, and it has produced a technology which uh, we're misusing and it has not developed properly. But it could produce something far better, right? Eh? I mean, if not for all this confusion, we could all be living very good lives, you see. This technology, even with the present population, could support a very good life if we really, we really got together and did it. <laughs> but it could be enormously improved, this technology, and changed and radically. You know, its whole purpose could be changed, its whole structure, uh, so that it would really serve the human being. Right? Uh, so uh, uh, the... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and it's thought, it's our present structure of thought that just plain stops it. People simply cannot get together to do that. <laughs> uh, now, uh, the, uh, and that's one reason why dialogue is necessary. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, yes, now, uh, and, and you have to get a different attitude to technology and to art and saying, uh, they're somehow to be more closely related, you see. Hmm? We can't quite see how it's to be done yet, but it's got to happen, right? Hmm? Uh, the, uh, uh, in fact, in, uh, um, somebody t I was looked up that, that the word, the Greek word techne meant the work of an artisan, according to my dictionary. And see, in that, there was already some notion of the union of, of technology and art, right? That, but it got split later when we call, took the word technology, which meant that the work of an artisan was connected to logos, to the logic, <laughs> and not to the art, right? <laughs> you see, it became organized by logic and words and became very abstract, you see. Hmm. Uh, excessively abstract. So it has to be abstract, but it was too, too abstract. So uh, the, uh, uh, a different approach to the whole thing would be possible. Uh, I mean, it would be quite natural, in fact. People would find themselves much happier with it <laughs> if they could do it. <laughs> because nobody really enjoys the kind of work that technology now leads to, I mean, in the factories and so on. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, 
Well, uh, now I think then that uh, we'll see. We're going to talk about time, so I'll first begin by looking at the time. <laughs> uh, see, I'm <laughs> making it concrete. <laughs> uh, but I don't know how you look at the time. You see. <laughs> <laughs> I say I'm looking at the time, but then I think about it. I say, how do I look at time? <laughs> I'm looking at the clock, not at time, right? At the watch. <laughs> and from there I infer time, you see. <laughs> you see, that illustrates one of the points about time. The time is an abstraction of thought, right? You see, time uh, can be measured by the clock and so on, but it's an abstraction. Uh, time becomes a description of, uh, uh, it's in correspondence in some way with the order of movement and process, of the order of succession, right? Things succeed each other, and we make a representation of that or a map in, in terms of time. We can draw a diagram and call it T, something, you know, we call it T, but it's really space in the diagram, not time. Uh, space is representing time, right? Now, it's very hard to represent time by time, you see. <laughs> I don't know how you would do it. <laughs> Uh, the uh, uh, we might try, but uh, the, you'll see certain problems in there as we go along. The uh, yeah, but that is a kind of representation of time. You're right. You see, we say very long times may be represented by rather short times in the movie. Hmm? Yeah. Right? You see, so we can represent time by time if you like. Uh, you can represent time by space, and you can represent time by a formula. Hmm? Theory is symmetrical. The straight line is the longest line. Zigzag is the shortest. Oh. They can see the end of it, so it takes a long time. Hmm. Going in zigzag, you see only that the same end. short. Same short. Uh -huh. Yeah, but anyway, our idea of time is tied to the idea of space because young children, according to Piaget, they estimate time by the by the distance covered rather than by the real uh, what we would call time. You see. You know, if, if something has moved further, they think it took more time. And uh, the uh, uh, now, uh, <clears throat> so so you see, time is a representation of thought, which we can represent in many ways. We can represent it, and now, and time, also we we believe it's uh, uh, what, but we also say everything happens in time. We talk about say at this point in time, right? Uh, where is this point in time? You see, <laughs> it's a metaphor at best, right? You see, that suggests a, a view in which time stretches like space from the infinite past to the infinite future, and here we are at this point, right? And we could then decide to go backward or forward, <laughs> but we can't, you see. <laughs> uh, there's a fellow called Dunn who made a serial theory of serial time many years ago. He said there are many kinds of time, you see. He said there's the ordinary time, and on top of that, there's another time in which you can look at the first kind of time as if it were space. Right? So you can think in the first kind of time it's like a train going through, <laughs> but it's being watched from the second kind of time. But then you get into a problem because you'd say, what well, you've just substituted one kind of time for another. So you say, but he says the second kind of time can be looked at as space from a third kind of time, <laughs> and so on. Right? So in that way, he hoped to explain things like Pre, what do they call it, precognition, by saying that there was a kind of time in which the thing was like space and you could see it, you would see it from another kind of time, right? And I don't, I'm not saying any of this is true, but it's interesting to uh, consider how people looked at time, right? Hmm? <clears throat> now, uh, the, uh, uh, see, if you, in, in the theory of relativity, time is looked at to some extent as a kind of space, and uh, it raises that question, how can you understand how things happen, you see? You say part moving through time is like being on a train, but then if you say it's like a train going through, then you have the second kind of time in which the train is moving, right? By, you see, you're looking at time as space, but from another kind of time, as Dunn did. So, uh, the, uh, therefore, relativity seems to violate our intuition that time is actually happening, right? Things are happening. Uh, and that's a puzzle. As one may wonder whether relativity is really that accurate, you know, whether there are some limits to it. Now, <clears throat> the uh, uh, now, uh, yes. So now let's look at it again. 
and say there's another way, which is our own experience, right? Now, from the point of view of relativity, we regard that experience as regarded as illusory, but let's turn it the other way around and say we, we actually experience it. We know an experience could be illusory, I've said that today, but maybe, and at least maybe we can look at it and learn something, right? Now, the, uh, uh, so in the actual experience of time, you, you say the past is gone, the future is not yet, you're right here, right? <laughs> now. But it's always passing, right? It's a mystery. <laughs> uh, now, what is the past, you see? You never see the past, right? You only see the memory of the past, which is present, right? You never see the future. <laughs> you only see the expectation of the future, which is present, right? When the next, there's a succession of moments, and when the later time comes, or, right, you can then see if what you remember of what happened agrees with your expectation of what happened. Right? So what you can do is, is to try to predict, not the future, but the past that the future will have. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? You see, because you cannot see the present and you cannot see, you cannot even describe the present and you can't see the future. Right? The future is unknown and anything may happen. It often does. You see that our, well, our expectations are often not satisfied. Right? Even the best theories fail. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, the, uh, uh, so now you can say what, 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 that the past doesn't exist. It's gone. The future is not yet. doesn't exist. Uh, but the present is conceived as a, this point in time which divides the past and future, therefore cannot exist either, right? That clear? You see, according to that line of reasoning. <laughs> so there's a paradox there. Now, if there's such a paradox, it may lead you to wonder whether that picture of being on a line in time is, in it, is really valid here. You see, so suppose you say, okay, what do you actually have? You see, the present, the word present is based on a Latin root, prescient, meaning standing in front of you. <laughs> it's presented, right? <laughs> And we have the immediate. I, I might say the, the present is not quite the immediate, you see. The present has been worked on by thought. What is presented is according to the past thought, right? Hmm. Its structure is given. Huh? So the present uh, is uh, not quite the immediate. And the immediate, how can you describe it? Right? <laughs> see, thought, we said, mediates. And that... The, the, the mediation done by thought is the immediate, right? It's part of the immediate. But we don't see that, right? See, so anything that we could describe would have to be mediated and would be behind the immediate, right? In other words, whatever we said it is, it's gone, right? And even so, it would be incomplete because we don't get it all. Not always right. But you say the present is not only the immediate, because it isn't the immediate present in some way, but yet the past is also presented in the present. The, the past is presented in memory, which is present, and the what we see in front of us is presented, but remember that it was not only the creative imagination that produced the uh, experience of the table, but also all our past experience with the table. It has contributed and fused in this presentation of the table in consciousness, right? Is that clear? extremely rapidly. It's yeah, it's happening. Simple. We don't see it happening. I'm suggesting that it, is, it must, it's, uh, it has to happen, man, somehow. But you're not saying that the immediate is not in the present. No, I'm, I'm saying the immediate, I'm going to suggest that the immediate, I don't know what it means, but it might be more fun, it could be given a meaning that is more fundamental than the present. I see. Mm -hmm. See, uh, in other words, we, in this area, we don't have to stick in exactly to the meanings because that may stick us to the old ideas, right? So we might extend the meanings. Hmm? Because we're talking about meaning anyway. See, all we're doing is discussing meaning now. <laughs> hmm? Because we don't know the fact, right? So would you, would you say that the, that the unfolding of the implicate order is a flow and that we are abstracting time from that flow? Well, yes, that's one way of putting it. But let's try to be more immediate in saying that the actual sense of succession is our 
uh, a way of uh, describing the flow, right? Something happens, something follows, something follows, something follows, right? And what follows contains a memory of what came before and an expectation of what's going to come, right? <clears throat> All of that is present at that moment, but it's also flowing at the very moment in which you say it is, it isn't. <laughs> it's a kind of paradox, right? Hmm? You can't hold it, you see. Hmm? Could there be a subtle absence of the past if one were looking at the tyranny of thought as the past? Yeah, well, well see, I, I think we shouldn't call it tyranny because that makes a kind of ju pejorative judgment, right? It's going to affect the whole system, right? You have to be careful. I mean, say, the past is doing certain <clears throat> things, you see. It ought to do certain things. It's not doing some of those things not rightly hmm? because of our thought getting muddled up. Hmm? But in the way something would disappear in the end when you looked at it, hmm? in that sense that the power would go. That's what I mean. It, it might go, yes. Uh, I mean, if it did, if all the power went from all the thoughts, then wouldn't then that... What? The past would disappear. Well, that's or, a conclusion, you see. Uh, there wouldn't be time. Sure. Maybe, maybe. The concept and the notion or image that we have of time is really is an, is an illusion. You've shown, you've dissected it. And shown yeah, it's not entirely an illusion in the sense that it, it leads to coherent results in a certain area, but it's limited. You see, if we use this concept of time, then we agree to meet according to that time, and then it will work, right? But when we try to apply it here in this area, it, it's incoherent. Hmm? Time is a limited concept. Now, it's not entirely wrong. You know, we absolutely have to have it and so on, but uh, uh, we can't work our life as it is today. Without it, more primitive lives, they had very little of the concept of time. But the way we've organized it, we really need it. Now, <coughs> the, uh, now, uh, the, uh, so, uh, but still it's limited, right? Now, there's a, something, the unlimited is beyond. See, there's a, ta it's tacit in our, in our cultural thought, that time is of the unlimited. Because <laughs> we say everything takes place in time. That's our assumption, right? Which is tacit. Hmm? Mm -hmm. That puts time in the unlimited. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We say whatever the unlimited is, it's got to take place in time. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? In fact, it puts time beyond the unlimited. It says, <laughs> hmm? right? it says it's limited by time. Right? <laughs> and so in effect, it denies the unlimited. Hmm? <laughs> Right? So we say, <clears throat> okay, so that's part of our culture. You know, <clears throat> now, the, um, and that has affected us, our whole being, right? Hmm. Space, the same status? Well, everything has to exist in space, too. We're, we're not questioning space at this moment, you see. Uh, you know, we'd have to go into that, right? But we might have to say, what do we mean by space and so on, right? Hmm. But we're questioning time because I think thought is more closely connected with time than space, you see. <clears throat> now, uh, the thought takes not only uh, represents time and it not only uh, creates the sense of time, right, by entering the presentation, by entering the immediate, but thought also take, requires time to, to work, right? So thought not only represents time, but it is of the order of time, right? It is a kind of self-reference. It is of the order of time that it represents. <laughs> it's in a, in a kind of a tangle here. <laughs> and <clears throat> it, it attempts to grasp the eternal, but it can't, right? It, it is never complete. It cannot grasp the eternal, right? It cannot grasp what is beyond time. Hmm? It, it has a limited grasp at any moment, and the next moment it may change. So thought itself changes in this time process, but reason is aiming at a conclusion that would not depend on time, right? Hmm? See the problem there, the, the incoherence. Are you saying time is unlimited or limited? Time is a limited concept, but reason, but time is in, created by thought, right? But thought also aims for the unlimited reason, which has unlimited validity. Is that clear? It aims for conclusions. In religion or in science, people aim for that, right? You see, they want to know about God, which will be true forever or a scientific law that would be true forever, right? Absolute time. Absolute time. Well, uh, yeah, uh, that, that it could be taken as an absolute. Now, the, uh, so is that clear or is this just confusing? You see, so time, uh, 
thought is, at the same time, thought is limited and it is of the order of time. It is a process in time. It is trying within that process to grasp something beyond time. <laughs> you see, and it can't do it. You see, and it, it, it leads to more incoherence. Right <clears throat> now, uh, the uh, 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 memory is a part of time. But uh, without memory, we wouldn't have. We wouldn't have it. Yeah, I mean, there are people who's who's. Uh, Brains are you know, suffered damage in, in localized parts, and and they might uh, they have a short term memory. Yeah, but then they have time for a short time. Short time, but they have they, they can't put anything in long term memory. No, they don't. Under, they don't have an experience of long term time. Right. So, so someone was suggesting that these over kind of overlapping memories that we have. You know, one one memory kind of goes on top of another. Uh, eventually create for us that sensation of time. Yes, there's a series of levels of memory uh, helping to create that sense of time, you see, now uh, through thought, you see, so thought, uh, tapping those memories, you see. <clears throat> now, uh, anyway, that, that, so you see, that there are a lot of paradoxes there in this notion of time, you see. Now, uh, but now suppose we say, what could be meant by the immediate, you see, I'm saying the present is in some way not quite the immediate because it's what's presented. It, the past has gone into it, right? Uh, but let's say there's the immediate, which is not mediated by thought, and therefore by time. Huh? That's the suggestion. We want to explore what could this mean. You see, you see, do you see the spirit I'm trying to do it, and not to say I'm telling you the truth about it, but rather this is a puzzle. What could it mean, right? You see now. Hmm? Are you talking about forming a concept? Well, no. I'm I'm just saying we are faced with a, a paradox and a puzzle about time. You see, it isn't coherent. But when you say, "What does it mean?" Are you saying, "What is our concept?" Of no, it? I'm I'm saying we don't know what it means. You see, if we had a concept, that would be the meaning. But if we don't have a concept, then we're having a different kind of. What does it mean? And I don't know the concept. Right? You see, that means something creative is needed. Right? Hmm? Which is about thought. <laughs> well. Thought may take part in it, but it's got to be beyond thought, right? If you're trying to use thought, which is time, to get to that, then you're well. Right that, that doesn't follow. Thought. We said that the the unlimited cannot exclude thought because then it would be limited, <laughs> right? So thought can play its part too. It's just it's not the dominant part, right? Hmm? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We it, generally we're operating with thought being dominant. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. It. Right. Now I'm saying maybe if we slow down and. Thought will be less dominant, right? Hmm. We're asking a question which thought cannot directly answer. What does it mean, right? Hmm. Seems like the first thing I'm faced with then is I can't wait for time. What do you mean? Well, like you said, if we all agree and we're going to meet here, and that works, but if we're going to deal with the immediate, we can't wait for a time when it's going to work now. Yeah, you see, if you say, well, tomorrow I'm going to have the immediate, <laughs> and then you have mediated it, right? Yes. You see, so it's a puzzle. You see, it's not, it's incoherent, it's not clear what it means. You see, so in facing incoherence, we have the opportunity for creativity. For that creative imagination or creative uh, reason, a creative movement of the mind to take place. Right? It doesn't take place in time, it just takes place. Somehow. You see. Yeah, let's say that, just uh, say, suppose we have the immediate, right? Just that's the word, right? And not mediated. Uh, now, suppose we try to approach it. We say we can have long stretches of time in our mind, we shorten them and so on. We try to focus right on this present moment, you see. But there's still a bit of time in there. <laughs> uh, now, uh, well, let's think about it a bit and say, the more you focus on, the more you uh, focus on the present moment, the more you lose the detailed content of consciousness. Do you see? Hmm? It's the detailed content of consciousness that distinguishes moments. <laughs> right? You could say that if you removed all detailed content from consciousness, one moment could not be distinguished from another. <laughs> You see, right? So uh, the uh, now, 
so as you move, therefore, toward the subtle, the depth of the subtle, you're moving away from that detailed content, right? Therefore, you're moving to a less of a distinction of time. Right? Hmm? So couldn't you say that, t- that if you, just for the sake of argument, that that the actual immediate moment, if we're, we could come in contact with it, free of memory, would not contain time. You see, it would be... The, it would be, all time would be in there because there's no distinction <laughs> from one moment to the next at that level. All right. How much of that can a human being... Um, it doesn't... It can't just go on and on. I mean, it's just like a momentary, instantaneous... Well, yeah, but uh, one instant of insight might change the whole thing, the whole process. Well, you see, like, what is the difference between this moment and yesterday? I mean, if you just say they're both moments, so how do you tell they're different? See, this moment contains, or let's say two moments, yesterday and the day before that I remember. I could say yesterday came after the day before. There's a difference, right? Yesterday certain things happened the day before, some other things happened. So I see they're different, right? Now suppose that we removed all those differences... There would be no way of saying one was different, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, it was any particular moment, right? Hmm? So as you abstract from all the differences, and remember saying that the abstract general and the level of thought may lead to the concrete at the level of being, right? Hmm? So it would lead, see, I'm saying that the concrete would be anything with, to do with time is abstract. <laughs> although we may experience it concretely. Uh, now, as you begin to remove these differences between times, then you know, the different, uh, therefore, we could say, uh, carrying that to the ultimate, you could say that all moments, could, no moment could be distinguished from another. You, you would not be able to tell at one moment that it was this moment and not that moment, right? Hmm? Except, some difference occurs. If you look at the clock, you know that this is a different moment from another one where the clock read differently, right? But you have no intrinsic sense of time other than thought, I'm trying to say. Hmm? And then primitive peoples had a very weak sense of time, right? They could think of yesterday and tomorrow and so on. (laughs) But you see, but thought cannot go without time, right? Talking about slowing down the whole pro- the whole process of thought has to. We will slow down in this process. At the same time, another process become a, a very fast one comes in, right? Thought moves. We get the illusion of time. It seems so. Yes. Well, thought creates the illusion that time is the ground of all existence. You see, not that time itself is an illusion, because it, insofar as it enables us to meet together, it's not an illusion, right? Hmm? In the thought. Process. We're moving. Yeah. The feeling that we exist in time may be an illusion. Exist in thought, then. Yeah, it's thought that creates, represents us as existing in time, and then we experience it that way. It becomes immediate. It, it, may, it may not be true, because if you, if you could look at uh, the universe, or an atom, or a forest, let's say the Amazon, suppose we don't cut it and destroy it, and 500 years from now look at the same thing, there would be no... No fundamental difference. No fundamental difference. So as far as those things are concerned, the universe or the atom or the forest, it's still the same. It doesn't have... uh, There's no concept or notion of time because it hasn't changed. No, not fundamental. Some details have changed. If you took careful note of the details, you would say time has happened, right? You see, but... See, if we now say we're abstracting from all that and moving into the uh, subtle depths, and in those subtle depths, there is no reason for time. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, I don't know what it would be, but we say, in the most extreme case, you could say it's the time, um, the moment which has no time is also essentially beyond time, it's eternity. See, eternity is that 
that that immediate moment is the contact with eternity or with what is beyond time, right? The word eternal may mean all time or it may mean beyond time, right? Now, uh, so uh, the the uh, uh, now then in that case, by if you're able to move that way, if the mind is able to move that way, then it's moved out of this uh, hold of thought, right? Hmm? Yeah, and the whole river of time, you want to call it that. That's kind of sad for all of us because we immediately wake up every day with the day of the calendar facing us. Maybe, maybe that's why a photon can move hundreds of thousands of light years across space without changing. It, well, doesn't, feel, it doesn't have, it doesn't have much to think about. Right? It doesn't <laughs> have any time in it. It may have no time in it, no you see. No time in it to no be Yeah. Well, no memory, you see. Yeah. You know, I get the impression that our sense of time is... One of the reasons is, you know, this whole idea that we talked about earlier about most of the process being hidden, but it's the actual movement of thought going on, most of it hidden from us, that gives us this sense of time yeah. that we get looped into all the time. Yes, it and it, it, gets, real. it gets into this program and so on, you see. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, so you can see that all the things we've been talking about, all the incoherence, may have a root which is deeper, you see. A general root, if, if this general root were gone, then the rest of the plant would go too. <laughs> subjective for me as we're doing this that time my experience of time as we're having this discussion is, is uh, very slowed down yes uh, uh, but it may not be subjective you see that there's any maybe many people feel that way right you see we're reaching a level of no distinction of subject and object you see the distinction of subject and object is also due to thought as i've explained and it also involves time in a way which we could work out. But uh, as we get beyond uh, thinking, be, be, be beyond this level of thought, we are going also beyond the distinction of subject and object. And the, uh, 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 the, that distinction arises from a certain kind of thought which does imply time if you go into it. <coughs> uh, You see, so that uh, now, see, so that suggests that if, if the human race could really get into this, then all these problems would vanish. You see, they would dissolve, right? <clears throat> because they all arise from this incoherence, the deep basic incoherence in the process of thought. Now, that doesn't mean that thought would not exist or anything. You see. Uh, you could even say thought must, as I said, must be contained in this, right? So uh, you could say even thought is a process. It's real. It's part of the uh, unknown, the immediate. And you see, the immediate being, thought is mediation. Its product is mediation. But its immediate, immediate being is the act of mediating, right? right? The process of mediating. So thought has an immediate being too. And... You see, if, if you could say that it, you could perhaps come to a level where this immediate would also contain a, an understanding or perception of thought, and the mediation of thought, right? The process as part of the immediate, right? So that time would be within the timeless. Right? Well, shall we say it's time? <laughs> the time is right.